This is Forge Daily with Mackenzie Barwell on the Forge Audio Network. Welcome to this episode of Forge Daily. I'm your host, Mackenzie Barwell, checking in July 19th, 2024. We are match day minus two now, Forge FC to take on Calvary FC this Sunday and here to provide his expertise and preview the match with me is CPL commentator Adam Jenkins. He shared his thoughts on what to expect from either side, some standout performers, and what it's like commentating this historic rivalry. 20 minutes of technical difficulties later. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Hey, I have screenshots of Mac Barwell that are going to go for a pretty penny on eBay or something. That shows how old I am that I used to eBay. That's a a podcast for another time. (laughs) I can't believe... And for context, everybody, I, for some reason, Adam's visual wasn't showing up on my end. So I just stood there looking at my computer, twiddling my Picking thumbs. Our nose. For, do not say that. That is, that is untrue. We're here now. That's all that um, matters. You've got, you've got the screenshots and I'm really glad uh, we're finally live. <laughs> How was your conversation with Kwesi? I know. You were talking to him before this. Yeah, I was trying to butter up Nico to give me some insight on how to... Um make him show his personality, which I've heard on multiple occasions. He has one of the biggest ones on the team, but he is so stone cold with the media that I feel like I'm just chiseling away slowly at the facade. And, and one day we'll get to see the, the truly exuberant Kwesi Poku, but he was lovely. I'm sure he's a very yes. popular guy right now with how well he's been playing. You're right. You're right. He's pretty stoic when it comes to interviews. <laughs> I've been trying for what a year and a half now. Depends. Sometimes I can catch him, but then it's almost like he checks mm. himself and, and goes back to the... A pro's yeah. pro. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, I look forward to hearing what came from that. Today, we'll talk about the Calvary Forge matchup on Sunday. You called the Pacific game, right? This past Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. I did, yes. So looking at that game and that result for Forge, what do you think they'll be happy with uh, coming out of that game they'll want to carry on to this weekend? I mean, I think they're going to continue to be extremely happy with Kwesi's play. I don't want to suggest that he's the only one um, performing for them, but with the tight turnaround for both of them um, from an emotional Canadian championship, Pacific disappointed at home, Forge elated at home. Um, I think the game sort of went the way that we would expect it to, a little bit of fatigue at times, not as cutting edge in the final third for both clubs and and in a lot of ways the same tropes that have followed both of the clubs this season played true and like I think Pacific are just happy to be home and with a little bit of rest and, and Forge are really happy with what that result did for them in the standings. Mm-hmm. Well of course Forge are in the Canadian Championship right now and Calvary aren't so I wanted to get your opinion on this Forge having come off a midweek game last week on Wednesday a great result against TFC Do you think that is a more advantageous situation to be in or from a Cavalry's perspective, you know, having that that rest and routine? Yeah, I think the last time I was on with you, it was kind of a a similar situation where we were talking about the Halifax Wanderers and how I was saying it was a bit of a a trap game for Forge in that sense, because Halifax was still looking for that first win. And at one point it was going to click and not to be lazy and just repeat the interview from last time. But I I think it's the same for Forge this week. I think Cavalry are fuming. They're probably the most frustrated team in the Canadian Premier League right now. They lost for the first time at home to York in their last match and, and now they a don't want to go 0 for 2 and b it's their biggest rival so i honestly think forge are going to be against a fairly well rested cavalry group that is going to be more motivated than perhaps they've been since can champ uh at bc place than they've been in a long time so there there's some frustration yeah. and urgency definitely seeping in i think there was a, a feature today on canpl.ca sort of outlining how good the Cavs have been and yet they're outside of the playoff points which is kind of wild to think that we're at the mm-hmm. midway mark of the season um and then now like just as patrice and uh, uh, patrice guys and the halifax wanderers had that when will they win shadow over their head cavalry until they start picking up results are, are gonna have this are they going to win the regular season and miss the playoffs like Atletico Ottawa had done last year. And and that's going to become tiresome for them until they start getting some goals. Okay, well, you talked about them conceding that game at home to York. And it's interesting, these conversations, because it's so uncommon for them to concede games at home. So what do you think it is about playing at Atco Field that is so difficult for the away team? 
the surface is definitely the biggest transition for anyone. Um, I think there's the two grass pitches in the Canadian Premier League. Of course, there's Halifax and there's Cavalry, but Cavalry's is entirely different. Um, Spruce Meadows famously knows grass and they know how to put on a, a good atmosphere and a good show. Um, the travel isn't easy. It's about four hours to get there from wherever you are. So on a tight turnaround, that's that's a bit of a challenge for other opposing teams. And then it's just the right. fact that Cavalry's... Yeah historically just such a good team at home they, they've really found a way to make it their own the supporters there are incredible the, the city is fantastic it, it's just it's an intimidating place to go and play so you can look at it from two ways if you're forge you can say forge or cavalry excuse me are in a tough moment this is our chance to sort of get the the vengeance for one of their worst league performances of the season the last time they were there or they can be on eggshells a little bit which i don't think is in their dna about the fact that Cavalry is going to have a match very, very soon where they put up three or four goals and, and remind everyone just how good they are. Yeah, I mean, in talking to Coach Bobby yesterday for Behind the Beard, I asked him to reflect on that last match in Calgary, and he said, no, <laughs> no. he just was like, no, I already burnt the yeah. film. I forgot about the game. But apart from that kind of odd one out, these games are always physical, always intense. The competitiveness is extremely high. Do you think this is the most historic rivalry in the Canadian Premier League? Yeah, I think so. Just on the competitive competitive balance of it all. I think Forge and York are becoming quite the rivalry, but the, the differences in atmosphere and how much York United supporters in the past have traveled to Tim Hortons Field and made it like that that hatred that obviously exists for 90 minutes and then the respect comes before and after but just in terms of the the sides continuously meeting in big games and, and how one-sided it's been there's always a sour taste in Cavalry's mouth and they've certainly stopped sort of downplaying the rivalry I don't think it's the only big rivalry in, in the CPL and I don't think it's the the team that oh, plays yeah. Forge the hardest for whatever reason if your club starts with a V you seem to play Forge harder than Cavalry does at Tim Hortons Field the time but in terms of what's what's been between them in the past, yeah, the, the, the animosity is definitely there. Yeah. How do you go about commentating games that are this physical and competitive? Because I would imagine I am very reactive in that way. And I've seen videos of you commentating and so are you. Like you're, you're jumping yeah. around, you're grabbing things. <laughs> so from a personal perspective, what do you look like? in the uh in the box when you're watching these games and talking at the same time yeah it's it depends on where we are most of what we do is in a five foot by three foot closet in mississauga so you get a little yeah, bit less atmosphere from the, um, from the studio so a lot and it depends on who's beside me um if it's jimmy brennan it's it's one way of handling it if it's jordan wilson like it's tonight the dynamics different it really just depends on the partner but it, it is admittedly significantly more difficult to to feel the atmosphere and have that translate into the commentary as much as we try our best to mitigate it but it, in terms of how do we call physical games i think Every match, we're sort of spending the first 10, 15 minutes like the coaches and the players are sort of seeing what's the bar going to be for the referee today. Like I know Carly Shaw McLaren, yeah. she called Pacific yeah. and Forge in the last match. She is one of the best young officials we have in Canada, but she is generally very lenient in the first half. She kind of lets the, the game play, and it's not just a Forge thing. It's she's, she's more reserved, I find, than some of the other referees that like a quick yellow to sort of stay on top of things. So you, you see where the ref is going so when for example when when sean mclaren has the whistle we know that the first half is going to be a little bit chippy and then in the second half at some point she's going to have to say okay enough's enough and then that gets coaches yapping and that adds another layer of of animosity if that was okay in the first 15 minutes why isn't okay in the last yeah. um so you're kind of feeling out the match as much as you can from four thousand kilometers away and 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 just understanding if there's beef in the past like i know last year we could always count on reza rama getting in it in, into it with someone especially like a sergio camargo when he was on the field or you, you kind of remember those past altercations and otherwise you're, you're just seeing or saying what you see and, and letting the match talk to you that way right it's that's funny you are in the same boat as the coaches and the players in that situation and feeling out where the referee is taking mm. the game i think i have the visual 
from the CPL final in my head when I think about like, and whenever I think about you commentating, it's just you like bunny yes. hopping after the Olympico. <laughs> that that will follow me for the rest of my life. Um, I really, I was like, <laughs> if I was a prouder person that cared about my self image, I wouldn't post a picture of me looking like a seven year old child with glee, but it honestly looks like that. It, like, it's me pacing. It is so funny. And that video circulated for yeah. weeks after the goal too. Yeah. I think the, the problem that. with that is you see that and you go, well, this guy's a big Forge supporter. And I'm like, I, I know I know how the sausage is made for all eight teams. I'm a supporter and a detractor of everyone. But it, like tr um, right. Fraser Aird could have done that. Vasco Fry could have done that. You're going to get the same reaction. But yeah, I, totally, I, I totally. love too. And maybe it's it's like, obviously when you're there, it's exciting. But when you're in the box, you literally don't have room to move. I, I sometimes stand up for the last five, 10 minutes if it's a tight game or a close game. But otherwise, you're sat in, a, in an office chair and you're doing your best to keep the energy. But mm -hmm. you know how big the press boxes mm -hmm. are in Hamilton. I pace that thing, get my steps <laughs> yeah. in during the broadcast. You're up and down, standing, sitting. Okay, well, I wanted to uh, talk about a conversation I had with Mitch Tierney early this, earlier this week because he enlightened me on the cavalry form and it's not very favorable in terms of their health mm. because big names like Ali Moosey, Charlie Trafford, William Akio, I believe they're all suffering injuries and a couple others that I'm forgetting right now. But how do you think absences like those will affect their group and have been? In recent yeah, years? I think it's, it's tough to say how will it because until the the match day team comes out you don't really know who's available like Sergio Camargo has been in and out of fitness Mile Henri who was one of their really strong players last year has been in and out of fitness um but there's no doubt they're missing Ali Moussi and, and how desperately he wanted to play the the Kanchamp game against Vancouver where he re-injured that ankle um so they're not a fit bunch right now so there's definitely that aspect to it and and I think the biggest problem for them as much as Tommy has tried trying to pour as much water on, on the flames there as possible is they can't just rely on, well, we're missing some key guys. That's where our offense is gone. Um, Tobias Warshevsky is very much in form and full fitness, and he's tied for the golden boot lead with, um, with Brian Wright and Ruben Del Campo. So they have goal scores. They just don't have all of their weapons. Um, Willie Accio being done for a significant amount of time. I think he might even be sidelined for most of, if not all of the year. Um, but yeah, that's another player who contributed countless goals for them. Meyer Bevan, who who chose not to return to the team with, with family matters before the season. That's the golden boot leader. So they have players that last year were carrying them offensively that they don't have right now. And they hope that um, their new signing, Valling, the German, um, can contribute, that Leighton Brooks can finally see it click and start pitching in on offense. But I think honestly, like, yes, they're missing Accio and Moosey and, and Camargo at full fitness, but they, they have Diego Gutierrez who's one of the best playmakers in CPL history for my money, who has been fairly quiet, admittedly in more of a defensive role, but they have the talent. They just need them to start producing. It's that right. simple. Right. Okay. So still that lineup is not to be underestimated despite a couple guys still being out for sure. A couple key guys, Mac. There's no doubt that they are. They would be like it's impossible to draw like for like, but you can almost imagine like not having one of Borges and Schwanier, and then um, uh, a Para, for example, or an old, like someone who just who can give you that speed yeah. and aggressive forward play. It's not a perfect comparison, but it's similar. For no, sure. I appreciate you drawing the parallels there. I think it uh, will put things into perspective a little bit more for the Forge community, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so looking at Cavalry's record, they've got three wins, eight draws, and three losses. But now that we're halfway through, when do you think will be a point they start to hit the panic button? You know what I mean? Because while they are one spot out from playoffs, as you mentioned in the last time we we talked each week, that window is, is closing, right? Yeah, I don't think it's in their DNA to panic. I think you could probably switch it and say if Forge was in Cavalry's shoes, they wouldn't be panicking either. Um, like we're, we're at the point where for a lot of these teams, they have fewer games remaining than they have games played, which right. is always a weird turn at this point in the season. So like it, it's the season is still not over. Like Valor could win the next five in a row and be two or three points off the playoff. Like that's how close it is from bottom to top. I think the only certainty is that Ottawa is a playoff team, barring some kind of calamity for them. Everything else is up in the air. I don't think 
that Cavalry knows how to panic. I think they'll trust that because their underlying numbers are so good, there's no panic. Now, if they were in this position and were being outpossessed and not creating scoring opportunities or not getting touches in the box, that's a different story. But when they're doing everything but finish, it's less of a panic and more of a, an incredible frustration, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Like they had 17 shots on target uh, or 17 shots attempt. I think one on target in the last game against York. And I think that was the stat. So like they're creating, they just need to be more clinical. Right. They lead the league in the amount of times they've hit the post. Like there, there's numbers there that are showing what? they're really close, but they're just not getting their goals. Yeah. Wow. And that's all the, the good work from Mitch Tierney since you name dropped him. Yes. Earlier. I'll, yes. I'll give him Shout out. <laughs> Shout out Mitch. Yeah. No, that's, and I think in that way, it's it's motivating, right? Because on the same side over here, you know, when they talk about the chances being created, it's not a diminishing feeling or demoralizing. It's like, we, we're right there. We just need to start finishing. Speaking of, mm. the guy you spoke to earlier today, Koisi Boko. That's right. So eight matches, in the month of June, eight matches played seven goals and two assists. Yeah. Now, this is someone we knew as a left back less than two months ago. Can you see him going back to that position? Yeah, I think he's intelligent enough that if they needed him to, he could. But I don't think they want him to. Exactly. In, in, right? unless, yeah. unless Jordan and Taryn get healthy and on good form and, and Bobby suddenly becomes, how do I get all three of them on the field? Then he might have to get creative and, and maybe you sacrifice a, a fullback for a, a Quasi depending on the match. But we don't know the full extent of Taryn's recovery. And right now, um, Quasi's been so good that he's getting the starting minutes over Jordan Hamilton, who is seemingly close to 100%. Um, so yeah, I, I and I think what I really liked about the conversation, um, and everyone will hear it Sunday during the game, either at halftime or pregame on Match Day Live, is um, the question. The first question that I asked him is like, I have to get it out of the way, this transition from defender to striker. And I could feel his eyes roll despite the, the stoicism that he displayed. And he's like, the thing that people don't know, uh, if you don't know me that well or don't know Forge that well, is I was an attacker before I was a defender. He said, I was an attacker before I came to Forge, but I knew the role I had to play and I had to adjust my game to be a defender to fit what Forge needed at the time. Um, now, he wasn't a striker at the CPL level, so that is the biggest difference. And, and I think everyone has those attacking instincts, but it's one thing to do it in your uh, League One Ontario or your development or your youth international days. Like when he played for the men's U20 team, he was either a center back or a fullback in that tournament. So that's where he has plied his trade professionally and at the highest level. So I think he is kind of not tired of the question, but he's like, Hey, I've, I've been an attacker before. Mm -hmm. He just happens to be an attacker again and doing it better than anyone in the CPL right now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. I talked to him yesterday too. And he was talking about his youth days as a striker, but he probably couldn't have, have imagined where he'd be right now. Yeah. Especially the success that he's having. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Cause he's, he's been marvelous. There's a reason he's the player of the month. And I feel like he's one player of the week, including this or last week's three of the last four or something. He's been that good. The, the thing that I found and it's possible, like I'm trying to remember it exactly, but I think when he scored his brace, I was looking up his goal scoring totals. I don't think he had scored until a month ago. Like maybe like, so it was either like 30 days or 34 days. He had no goals in the league and now he's tied for the league. Lead. Well, right. So they've been in such close succession that it's just been bang, 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 bang. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully uh, he's able to keep it going this Sunday. That's all I have for you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you again. And sorry for the 20 minute <laughs> technical delay. At least you have the photos from it. And a virus on my computer that you gave me. <laughs> so Forge will be receiving a, a bill from the Apple store to yeah, fix whatever has whatever okay. happened. Here. Okay. Okay. Bad Wi-Fi. Give me a break. Okay. But seriously, I look forward to seeing that interview and uh, we'll likely chat soon. Yes, ma'am. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, that will conclude today's episode. A special thanks again to Adam Jenkins for taking the time. I did try and warn him the last episode we did. If he wanted to come on, it was probably going to happen a lot. So <laughs> that won't be the last time you see Adam. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I suggest you do the same thing on One Soccer this Sunday at 5 p.m. to watch your Forge FC take on Cavalry. This has been Forge Daily with Mackenzie Barwell. If you like what you heard, please like, follow, subscribe, comment, and share. 